this. I want you to look at the difference between the top photo where he's like buff and in good shape and happy and clear-eyed and the bottom where he's laying on a couch wearing a t-shirt, you know, putting on weight, blurry-eyed. That's his MySpace friends. <laughs> so now you know why. <laughs> That's where the child support and the sleep is going. Okay, so you guys are hackers. You learn about exploits and you try to figure out countermeasures. So you wear, you know, you, you decide, you know, these, these facial recognition cameras aren't going to get me. I'm going to go to the novelty store and get a Groucho Marx nose and glasses and walk down the street. Won't help. There are now facial recognition algorithms that are being developed and being made better and better and better and better on a daily basis almost that any piece of exposed skin can be compared. 95% accuracy. Now, for certain things, that's crap. That means if you check 1,000 people, you're going to get 50,000 false positives. The answer to that is you take that subset of 50,000 people and you rerun them and rerun them until you're fairly accurate. But the nose and glasses won't work. So let's say you get a hoodie, you pull it up, you get the elephant man's mask and you walk down the street saying, I'm a human too. <laughs> Won't help. They will recognize the elephant man's gait recognition. This was first developed, I spoke about this at Stevens. This was first developed, of course, in surveillance crazy England. I don't know if you guys remember Monty Python's Ministry of Silly Walks. <laughs> That's probably who developed it. But they have a thing that can tell who you are by the way you walk. And the proof that it has some potential, FBI is investing a billion dollars, I mean like, like the little guy, a billion dollars in the technology. Cameras are going to be able to look at how you walk. You wear a hat, you wear a hoodie, you wear a mask. It's Bob with a hat, a hoodie, and a mask on. And by the way, this is one time when intrusive technology was great. This guy was a pedophile, and they found him molesting little children on pedophile websites. That was the original photo. Dutch cops figured out how to unswirl it, and they arrested him. So even if you think you can conceal your photo and do other things, forget it. All right. So you say, they're going to recognize me. They can tell how I walk. I'm going to get in my car and I'm going to tint the windows, and I'm going to travel safely, and only like pop out at the last moment and run into the building. This particular Listen. system uh, is capable of turn capturing up to 3,000 license plates in an hour. We have two forward-facing cameras and one side-facing camera. The side-facing camera is uh, out at a 90-degree angle, and it's basically for doing parking lot applications. I can go into a uh, parking lot of a shopping center and uh, drive down the, the lanes of the parking lot. And as I'm doing that, I'm running every single license plate in that parking lot. The forward-facing cameras, um, one is forward-facing to the lane to the left, and one is forward-facing to the lane to the right. And what I'm getting there is uh, typically oncoming cars and the camera to the right uh, would be either cars in the number two lane or cars that are parked along the side of the road. So what the screen gives you here is it gives you an overview picture of the vehicle. The software then isolates the license plate and it gives you the plate patch. And what you see here in the yellow box above the plate patch is what the software actually read the plate to be. So one of the other applications for this system is to frequently check parking lots for vehicles that are of interest to the police. Just want to show you one. Thing. But uh, auto theft and traffic enforcement only scratch the surface of what ALPR is capable of doing. We also uh, have look at that picture. That's for real. This this if you if you are observant enough, drive down the interstates. You will see every overpass, every bridge abutment, every possible place to mount a camera. Cameras are now being mounted. If there is a bolo, if there's a be on the lookout notice for Bob driving Subaru license plate ABC123, it will be programmed into the license plate recognition alert. The minute you drive down the street, a cop will know where you are, 
be vectored right into. That's a good thing. Now, a bad thing? Bob is an annoying hacker. We want to know who he's meeting with and where he's going, but he's really sensitive to surveillance. And he checks his car for bumper beepers, and he doesn't have an iPhone, and he takes the battery out of his phone. And he pays cash for everything. They can still track you. A couple of things, and I'm going to now start going through this at the speed of light because we want to allow time for the Q&A. It's gotten so good, this is a real Quaviti billboard. They now have billboards. You look at the billboard, the billboard looks back at you, knows how long you're looking at the billboard, what you were looking at. Facial recognition glasses. Now, how many times have somebody come up to you, Bob, how you doing? And you're like, oh shit, who is this? <laughs> All you have to do in a couple of years, hit a button. Oh, this is Fred. He owes me $50 and uh, you know, he's always trying to mooch money off of me. Yeah, I'm sorry, I don't know who you are, go away. It's, this is an actual beta testing pair. CCTVs, just letting you know, not very worthwhile in the real world. If you catch somebody and you've got the video, you can use it to convict them. But actually using it to catch them, not very effective. Now, you know, the one thing is photos of a crime in progress, um, it's a great thing. I mean, it's a photo. Photos don't lie. You know, it's not like a photo can be made to show you doing something you, you, you didn't do or events, <laughs> or events that didn't happen. I, I love that one. Oh, final word on surveillance cameras. Okay. One more time from Baltimore. There you go. Okay. Very quickly interpretation of activity and behavior. I've been talking for two hours now, how people watch you and how people track you and how they gather this. One of the most important things is they've got all this data. What the hell do they do with it? Well, they run it through artificial intelligence programs and they run it through other programs that interpret it for them. Instead of an analyst sitting there with printouts or in front of a computer screen, the computer decides if you're a good guy or a bad guy. And a lot of times, it's legit. I mean, you check flights to Iran right before a bombing and split. You buy a book on fighting cancer. Either you or somebody you know has cancer. You rent a gay porno movie. You're probably gay. You put an address into MapQuest. You're interested in that address. You fill a prescription for Xanax. You fill a prescription for Viagra. Duh. Here's my favorite one. You're on a plane four times this year, sitting next to the same woman who's not your wife. I mean, unlikely it's a coincidence. And it means something. And this is the state of things today. There are two big programs that are being constantly worked on and updated for the US government to interpret that. One is called NORA, which stands for Non-Obvious Relationship Awareness. This was started in Vegas casinos. The stuff that you see on that show, I think it's called Casino, right? Or Vegas or whatever. James Kahn plays the casino owner and it shows they zoom in on the guy's face and it immediately tells them who it is and it pulls up his whole history. Absolutely legit. Casinos really do that and really can do it. And it's being developed for the government. And the example of this when it was pitched by the casino guys to the government was the blackjack dealer once shared a telephone number with the sister of the guy now winning big at his table. Think about that for a second. Not hard to do for a database. There's something called advise, analysis, dissemination, visualization, insight, and semantic enhancement. Only the government could name that. This is being developed for DHS, Department of Homeland Security showing links between data and all the links of these links to individual people. In 2004, DHS at their, at their big conference in Virginia that they held that year, at that time, their requirement was storage for one quadrillion links. Then, now, beyond belief. Now look, I'm an investigator. I'm not going to stand up here and say, ooh, this is all bad. Because sometimes it's good. 
when the government actually uses the right information in the right way and does its job, it saves lives. It could have saved 3,000 lives right here in New York. Let me interpret this for you. Of the 9-11 hijackers, two were known as al-Qaeda terrorists who were coming into this country to do a terrorist act. Al-Hizmi and Al-Midhar. They were known. They were known to the CIA. They were known to the FBI. Unfortunately, the CIA didn't tell the FBI they were already in America. That's another story. Fourteen of the other terrorists could have been linked to them through the most basic database checks that even a private investigator could have done. Mohammed Atta, the ringleader, shared an address. Five other terrorists shared a telephone number with Atta. Another terrorist shared a frequent flyer number. And another terrorist not on the watch list shared an address. Just this basic database matching, if it had been done, if it had been done in a timely way, and it had been done efficiently, the World Trade Center would conceivably still be standing. And this would be a different world. So this is not always a bad thing. It's a bad thing when it's used on innocent people. Now, I'm going to flip through a lot of this. I'm sorry. I want to talk about, we're going to talk five minutes about a real world case. And then we're going to go into Q&A. When you're an investigator and you're building a profile on somebody, when I teach these classes, I tell people it's like pulling a piece of string. As soon as you have something to pull on to, something to hold on to and start pulling, you're going to get more information and more and more. Now here's a very, very typical use. You have a, a telephone number. Everybody knows the telephone number is going to give you a name and an address. From there you get a date of birth and a social security number. By the way, anybody who doesn't believe me, I'll demonstrate it to you later. Past addresses, family members, places of employment, businesses, corporations, real property, public records, marriage, divorce, voter registration, criminal records, civil court, every type of filing, UCCs, taxes, permits, licenses, carry permits for guns, your driver's license, your motor vehicles, accidents you've been in, credit reports, phone bills, credit card bills, 800 number calls, purchasing histories, donations. I don't have a screen big enough. It would go up, down the ceiling, down the other wall in the back. As long as you've got a good starting point, you can build on it. This is basic database investigation. It's done a billion times a day by law enforcement and private investigators. So, look familiar? <laughs> Two years ago, before the HOPE talk that was rudely preempted, I went on Off the Hook, the 2600 radio show, which you should all listen to, and I asked for a volunteer. And the next morning, I got an email. Hi, my name's Rick Dakin. I want a volunteer. I'm a writer. And then he gives his very brief contact information on the bottom. So the first thing I did was I ran the phone number. Now, Obviously, out of respect for Rick, a lot of the information is going to be truncated. Just by running the phone number, we were able to get his name, his address, his social security number, his date of birth, where he works, and that he's a real person. It seemed legit, so I gave him a call. And I said, Rick, we had a problem in 2004. I did this with a guy who I met the day before as a courtesy. He said, look, I'd just like to know what you got on me so I don't have a heart attack in the audience. And I met with him, and I showed him everything I'd gathered. And that night, I got a call at my office from his attorney who said, I know he gave you permission, but if you do the presentation, I'm going to sue you. I'm going to spend the rest of my life filing lawsuits against you. So I couldn't do it in 2004. <coughs> in 2006, I had a waiver ready. And I sent it down to Rick, and Rick signed it. And I want to read you one key paragraph. Pelorium, which is my agency, may disseminate any information about me which it obtains and or compiles to any person in any venue as it sees fit, even if the dissemination of that information could cause me harm, emotional distress, 
pain, injury, humiliation, or ridicule, or other personal or financial da damage, and even if the information disseminated is partially or completely false. <laughs> okay, you know what? He signed it and had it notarized. <laughs> and he's right here. <laughs> and we have good... That's, and he's not going to have a heart attack. Here's what we did and didn't do. We spent a morning, that's it, from breakfast to a late lunch. No field investigation whatsoever. I didn't send people out there. We didn't do interviews. We didn't do garbology, you know, stealing is trash, which, by the way, is an unbelievable investigative technique. We didn't do pretext. We didn't call up his family and say we're calling from the hospital and, you know, Rick's laying on a, a gurney who's his medical insurance company or any of that good stuff. We didn't use any government databases. We used what is available to civilians. I mean, well, connected civilians, but civilians. We use Gorilla Trace. We use Diogenes. We use something under development called Oink. <laughs> we started with the phone number. We got his name. We got his social security number. We got his date of birth. We got where he worked. We then took the social security number and ran that. And we got every name and every address associated with it. Which, and this, by the way, is a routine thing for investigators. It costs one dollar to do. And we got every address he ever lived at, including a guy who was the name of a guy, Jeffrey Stanford, who was using his social security number. More information and more information and more information and addresses. In less than five minutes, we found his complete name, social security number, when he got it, where he got it, somebody else using it, date of birth, the addresses. Then we pulled Rick's credit report, which he signed a waiver for. And we got everywhere he banks and how much money he makes and all the employers he's ever shown and how quickly he pays his bills. And he pays them pretty damn quickly, which is good to know because he's taking me to dinner tonight. And we found out that he's shown as a property owner at his address. And we pulled the property record. And we pulled the property appraiser record, which said 89000 bucks. And we figured, no way, you know, not even in this economy, and we went to Zwillow, which is even better, and they gave us an appraisal of $174,284. And then we decided to take a look at the property, again, without leaving the desk. So we went, we got closer, and we got closer, and we got closer, and Rick was looking up at the saddle. <laughs> that's, actually, that's actually the photo that we got off of his MySpace page. So that was legitimately obtained, and we found out what his apartment is like. And he lives in Florida, and remember that big parking lot. There's no public transportation, big parking lot. So he pulled his car and what he drives and who his insurance carrier is and running the condo address through Business Finder America. We got his company, and we ran him through Gorilla Trace, and we got 43 pages of stuff, every profile, every blog, every MySpace page. We pulled him through Zoom Info everywhere he ever worked, what he did at those places. We found, now there's something called Domain Finder where you can put in a name or an address. We found out he had a domain called Pornophiliac, <laughs> which, which was not up at the time. And stop right there, because I've heard all the jokes about getting it back up. <laughs> and, and we found rickdakin.com and bluekingstudios.com. And we went to the Wayback Machine, which is a great friend for investigators. And we found every single post and all the previous incarnations of his websites. And we found his Amazon.com author bio, which had everything he wrote and where he hangs out. And even, where the heck is it? Even where he has coffee for breakfast. Well, then it was accurate. This is two years old, by the way. And we found the books that he wrote. And we found, God bless him, one of the most comprehensive MySpace pages ever put up. Photos, 27 friends. Everywhere he went to school, the school for the, for the terminally whatever, and American University, and that he's in the middle of his master's program, and his companies. And for job, he writes, I own the damn thing. Thank you very much. And, and that he's single. He's a, an Aquarius. 
He's a graduate student. He's an author. Um, you know, what he's written, music, television, Rick's resume, which we found by going into a hidden directory, but that was fair. That his latest book is Geek Mafia. We found, I mean, how hard is it to interpret a web posting saying, up is downism and homophobic hate, Bush and Republicans are assholes. <laughs> He's probably a Democrat. <laughs> Actually, we found out after reading an endless supply of posts, I mean, this guy must carry a laptop with him. He's, a, he's actually an anarchist, and that he didn't register his car for six months and he got in trouble. And these are the, and these are the podcasts that he downloads, so we know he's a lefty. And he listens to Air America, and we found one hilarious post called, Can't Sleep, Clown Will Eat Me. <laughs> so, so, so we know that he's either a Simpsons fan or he spent too much time in Hungary or as a kid he was frightened by a guy with a big red nose. And we found photos, which I have to tell you, the holy grail of investigators. If I'm going after you, I want to know what you look like. I had more photos. Here he is, by the way, lockpicking at a previous con. <laughs> and all of his friends, who they are, where they live, they own cats, they're black belts. One's a literature professor. One went to, is involved with Ringling School of Art and Design. Real place, by the way, I thought it was a joke. I mean, all of his friends, we find his parents, where they live, that he's got no felonies or serious lawsuits. We found his cell phone and traced that. And then we went into the marketing databases and we found out he likes Mexican food and Thai food. He used to go to this place near Cryptic Studios called Hobies or Hobbies? Hobies, and he used to eat there a lot. They had a sandwich called the Rick, not really, but almost. And then one moment of confusion. We find there's going to be a launch party for his book, Geek Mafia, which he had just written at that point. Good, good book, and we're going to be giving it out for free in about two minutes. And I find this guy. That is you? OK. Is that you? OK, but it sure looks like him. A freakish resemblance, like separated at birth. And, but, but one is Rick Dakin, and the other is Kyle Cross. And Rick had said, well, you might find some interesting things out about me, and one thing in particular. Yes, I did. Yes, I did. I told you about it. But, but maybe, aha, an alias, another life. But then I ran Kyle Cross, and I found out that when Rick was in California, Kyle Cross was in Washington, was it was in uh, was in uh, was in Florida, and it wasn't him. So to summarize, in four and a half hours, Rick's name, address, everywhere he ever lived, everywhere he ever worked, all of his friends, his religion, his sexual orientation, his date of birth, his social security number, his freaking astrological sign. Basically, everything he does, everything he likes, whatever. Real world example. On Rick. I always wanted to say this. But wait, there's more. <laughs> After Rick and I did this, we got to be friends. Mainly because he figured he better be my friend. I, <laughs> I know everything about him. But we really did get to be good friends, and we started talking about doing a project together. And Rick called me up. And he said, I got a great idea. You know, when we meet, I'm going to talk to you about it. And he says, let's do a book where you investigate me. I try to stop you. But we have to do it differently since you've read. And we tossed it around, and we figured out, and if you know me and Rick, this is even going to be funnier. But even if you don't, we made a bet. The bet is Rick tries to hide. I try to find him. I mean, actually find him. You are at this location right now, or tag you're it, or that sort of thing. If Rick can stay hidden for 60 days, he wins. And I have to vote straight Democrat in the next election. <laughs> and trust me, you would see on Google News, private investigator jumps off bridge before, before that happens. If Rick stays hidden for 60 days, he wins. If I can find him 10 times, 
in the year I win. And he has to vote straight Republican. And you would basically see novelist jumps off bridge before that happens. So we made this bet, and Rick, and this really happened. We put a year into this. We're done. We put a year, huh? Right. We finished, we finished, when did I come back from Belize? When was the Church of Cthulhu thing? <laughs> no, I'll explain that. No, 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 I'll explain that in a second. When was that? Okay, we finished in December. Right. So, what happened is, he really tried to hide. He got offshore bank accounts and credit cards and phony names and stayed, I mean, it was his excuse for staying with every girl he ever met. And, 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 but he got a fake place and he started dealing. And, I mean, drop phones and everything. I mean, he really tried. And I caught him pretty easily a couple of times. And I'll tell you about some of the busts. We wrote a book about it, by the way, called Stealing Your Own Identity. There's a website up, and you can register for the book, and we'll give you autographed copies if you register. And yes, I am shilling this, and I've never done this before, but it, the, if I stood here till midnight, I couldn't cover all the stuff. So yeah, there's really a reason for the book. And here's some of the busts I did. And by the way, we called a truce after the ninth bust, so we can both vote our consciences and, <laughs> and, can, and basically cancel each other out, I'm sure. So the truth is, we should probably you know, go out for dinner on election day and not even bother, but, and then I'll sneak out and vote, but never mind. <laughs> so here's what I did. Let me tell you about some of these busts. Rick is, Rick is an author, and he sells a lot of his own books. He's got, like, a house full of books, and he services Amazon, and he services people who go to his website. So I set up a dummy email account, and I started emailing him as a bookstore owner, as an obnoxious British bookstore owner, but I, I, in each of these things I tried to be fair, and I called myself Rusty Shackelford. <laughs> and, and he didn't know, because he's not a TV watcher, he didn't know who Rusty Shackelford is. He doesn't know that's the, the Prince of Paranoia from, from King of the Hill. So, oh boy. So I started emailing him, and he started emailing me back. I said, I can't get your books, you're not responding. I'm going to cancel this order and go with somebody else. And he started emailing, I'm sorry, you know, Mr. Shackelford. <laughs> and finally, I got an email from him. We had an alert that would, that would send it right to my cell phone. And it didn't matter, I was sitting in my office when he uh, responded. He was, eating, he was eating breakfast in a Panera cafe, and he logged in from Panera. And I got the IP address, and it was a traceable IP address. <laughs> and I didn't have anybody in the area, so I couldn't really do tag your it. And he was 1,000 miles away in Florida. I was in New York. So I got the phone number of Panera. I said, this is an investigator. It's urgent. Get me the store manager. <laughs> <laughs> this is an honest to God true story. I've got an MP3 file of the call, and it's going up on the website. You can. Everything I'm telling you about will be proven. So I said, sir, my name is Steve Rama. I'm an investigator. All true. I didn't lie. I urgently need to reach a guy who's in your store. He's about 250 pounds. He's bald. His name is Rick Dake. And he said, well, we know Rick. He's a local author. I said, look, you've got to get him to the phone. So I hear the manager going, Rick Dake, Rick Dake to the manager's phone. <laughs> and you'll be able to hear this. And Rick goes, uh, yeah, hello. And I said, Rick, you're busted. <laughs> That's number one. <laughs> okay, number two, number two, cell phone triangulation. Except for this one, I had my friend Harry Goldstein, who's an investigator, in the area. We knew he was somewhere in Sarasota, Bradenton. We didn't know where. We were able to trace his car to a parking lot. At 10 o'clock at night, by the way, in a mini mall, and we knew there were only one of three stores open. So I said, Harry, go to this particular mini mall. And his car is really easy to spot, by the way. First of all, we knew the license plate. And second of all, it's got a big geek mafia sticker on the back. <laughs> so Harry says, yeah, it's parked in front of this bar. What was it called? Jake's, Jake's place. Shakespeare's. Shakespeare's, right. Parked in front of Shakespeare's. And I said, OK tell me what's parked next to it. He says, okay, there's a red Ferrari next to it, and this and that. So I called up Rick on his cell phone, which was fair. 
Oh, I called the bartender on that one. That's right. Called the bartender. He was sitting at the bar. The guy says, yeah, I know Rick. Hands him the phone. And I said, Rick, Steve, you're busted. He said, how'd, how'd, how'd you get me? I said, you know, satellite. By the way, your car's parked to a little parked next to a red car. He said, how the hell do you know that? I said, busted. I go. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then we. Then we did a. Then we did a credit card trace to an airline ticket. We found we found one of his credit cards that he purchased because we had gotten a frequent flyer number, and and the frequent flyer, by the way, was inactive. So I went onto their website as Rick Dakin and reactivated it, so I would know exactly what flights he was taking, what seat he was in, and everything, and and. My, my, my little cousin was getting bar mitzvah in Los Angeles, and I saw that he was flying through Los Angeles. Six o'clock in the morning, he goes to check in. I walk up to him, I say, hey, Rick, how you doing? At LAX. <laughs> I've got, I've got I'm, wearing a, I'm wearing a Brooklyn Dodgers sweatshirt. I put my arm around him, and a guy takes our picture. His face, you know, you know the, the, the MasterCard were priceless. Match.com. Okay, this is the one where I thought Rick was actually going to, I mean, he's a big guy, and he, and he takes martial arts. I used to box, but I'm getting old. Fortunately, Kung Fu Panda calmed down, and, <laughs> and, and, he, and, he didn't, and he didn't kick my ass, but I'll tell you what happened. I got this really attractive PI from Arizona, Michelle Stewart, real nice looking girl, who's a good friend of mine. Look. Rick's a single guy, computer literate. You know he's got a Match.com listing or something. <laughs> so we did the proximity search, and we found his listing. No name. Just like, you know, a horny author or something. I forget what it said. <laughs> but we found it, and we set up a phony profile for Michelle, and we got her a drop cell phone and an identity and everything. We set it up like it was a CIA. Believe me, better than that Italian CIA operation. <laughs> And we, have, we had her start corresponding with Rick. And just the hilarious profile. I used to be a cheerleader, now I'm a nurse, I'm moving to Florida, I'm going there to check out jobs, I'm just getting divorced, I haven't dated in years. Guys love hearing that, by the way. <laughs> you know, I'd love to meet you while I'm there. And Rick is like, yeah, sure. <laughs> so they set up a meeting, they set up a meeting, and we thought, it was going too easily. We thought, oh man, Rick is a smart guy. He's really seeing through this one. So we set it up. We set it up where we started calling his cell phone and we busied out his cell phone so she could call and he would hear a real voice. She could call with this really sexy, naughty voice and say, I'm on my way to the cafe, whatever it was. And, and just in case you don't recognize me, I'm wearing, I'm wearing uh, cut-off shorts and a white tank top. And I'll be there like 10, 15 minutes late. Wait for me. Let me just say that Rick was there, and I walked in with a bouquet of flowers. <laughs> so, yeah, and, 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 Michelle, and Michelle never left Arizona. She sent him a real, you know, she sent him a whole note, I'm really Michelle Stewart, and I operate JAG investigations, and so on and so forth. Okay, now one of the, one of the more annoying ones, at least in terms of privacy, I knew that Rick wasn't feeling well. And I knew that from some purchases he had made. So I went and I did a Google proximity search near his house, found his pharmacy, called it up. They said, uh, yes. I said, I said, I'm Rick Dakin. You know, I just want to be sure my prescription's ready. Because I wanted to find his doctor's name. And they said, oh, Mr. Dakin, you know, your prescription's not due to be refilled for another 45 days. I said, are you sure? Which, which, which one is that? Which doctor is that from? They told me the name. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I, I called the doctor's office and I said, hi, I'd like to make an appointment for Rick Dakin. Uh, can you, uh, uh, you know, do you have any days open? And they said, oh, Mr. Dakin, you're due for your 90 day something or other. Thank you so much. Um, you know, what should, can, can we tell you now or send, should we send you a postcard? I said, why don't you do both? So they told me the appointment time and date and they sent them a postcard. 
And he took the postcard, and being a good little patient, he went to the doctor's office. <laughs> and we got him. <laughs> now let me tell you two, some of the scarier ones. Most of you either know or don't know, with this crowd you probably know, that cameras have embedded tracking tags and EXIF tags. Every photo that you take has in it an embedded note, Rick Dakin took this photo, Bob took this photo what camera you took it with, the day, the time, everything. I went on Rick's website, and I knew that he had stopped posting to his website, but he was still communicating with his friends. And I figured he had to have a Flickr site or whatever, and I couldn't find it. I went on his website, and I yanked down some photos, and I saw that they were all consecutive numbers, and then there were big blocks of numbers missing. And you had to figure that these were photos that actually showed where he was and what he was doing that he didn't want to post where I could see him. So I checked the photos and I got the EXIF tags and to make a really long story short, we ran a program where we hit Flickr, we grabbed all the photos matching the mixing, no, mix, mix, matching the particular EXIF tag numbers and those ranges. We checked them for the EXIF number we found Rick's hidden website, and on that website we found out that he was going to a Master of Fine Arts course in Wisconsin. Oh, that's right, I'm sorry, Seattle. Excuse me. Oh, I have Washington up there. Okay. And I called him at the school, and I said, you're busted. And he said, no, no, I'm not busted. No, 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 no. I'm not busted. I, I'm, I'm not going to accept this as a bust. That's right. That, see, even I need to read the book. I called the, registra I called the registrar's office, and I said, this is really urgent. Could you give Mr. Dakin a note with this phone number? Tell him Big Pig needs to speak to him urgently. So they went and they put a post-it on his dorm room door. And he had somebody call, so it wasn't him, so it wouldn't be contact. He had one of his fellow MFA students call and say, uh, this is Dolores DeLago calling, and uh, you know, no bust and whatever. So I called him up and I said, come on, Rick, do you really, you're gonna make me pay to send a private investigator there to hand you a note saying you're busted? Okay, okay, I'm busted. <laughs> then finally, Rick started getting really, really good at this. Really good. And I was at 45 days without finding him. And I do not wanna vote. Democrat. <laughs> so I put up a website, which is still up, you can look at it, called rickdakenhunting.com. <laughs> Basically wanted, we're looking for this guy, it's a bet. Anybody gives me information, I'll put you in a book, I'll pay you money, just tell me where to find this guy right away. <laughs> what else did I do? I went to all the investigative and law enforcement news groups and I said, I need help finding this guy. Here's the bet. This freaking lefty writer is going to make me look bad. <laughs> help me find this guy. In three days, I got 5,000 unique hits on the web page. <laughs> Presumably all investigators. And people started sending me the freakish, I mean, he's seen them. The freakish email, like, you know, let's put a bolo, be on the lookout out on his car. We'll have him picked up and we'll tell you where he's locked up. And <laughs> No, no, don't do it. <laughs> Finally, finally, one guy realized what I didn't realize. When I started looking for him, I checked all the public records. I hadn't rechecked them. This guy did a brand new search with brand new eyes. And he saw that Rick had formed something called the Church of Cthulhu. <laughs> Long story, you'll read about it in the book. It's not as freaky as it sounds. It's not guys with hoods and sacrificing virgins mainly because there are no virgins in Florida. And <laughs> anyway, anyway, that's why there's no volcanoes in Florida, no virgins to sacrifice to them. Anyway, so somebody found it, and we ran the Church of Cthulhu, and we found a phone number, and the phone number led to a website, and we found out they were having a church ceremony, and I flew down to Florida, and in the middle of the church ceremony, I went in and went, and we called the truce. And we, wrote, and we wrote the book, 
and you can reserve a copy at stealingyourownidentity.com. Now, quick recap, promise this will take 30 seconds. In fact, less. Every bit of information out there that can be gathered on you is being gathered. And it's not just being kept in separate places with a Chinese wall between it. It's being combined, it's being cross-referenced, it's being filtered through artificial intelligence scripts. And if I have any lead on you, any identifier, any initial piece of information, I can build out from that to your entire life story. There's a reason for it. It's not all privacy invasion. If you apply for a mortgage, the bank has a right to be able to find that about your finances. If you hire a nanny, you should be able to know if she was a child molester. If you're dating somebody from another city and getting serious with them, you should be able to, to effectively do a background investigation on them to know that you're not marrying son of Sam. It is just too easy to do fake ID. I did a job in California and I got permission from the law enforcement agency that I was working with to go out and get fake ID. Here's my driver's license is David Markman, Salvatore Romano. Uh, this was David Halkin, I think. Anyway, not a problem. Now, by the way, it's not just because I'm a skilled private investigator. I know how to do all this crooked stuff. Raise your hand if you know who this is. Like one or two hands. Sir, who is that? That is President Bush's daughter. That is Barbara Bush. I don't know if you remember this, about five, six years ago, her and Jenna got fake ID so they could go out drinking underage. Now, how you do that when you've got three Secret Service guys glued to you, I don't know, but this is their fake ID, which was confiscated, and a guy sent me an email of it, and you know, that's, anybody can get this. Anybody in college knows how to do that. You can buy passports, you can get bank accounts, you can do whatever you want. LifeLock, this moron who's on every radio station, <laughs> enroll in LifeLock, my, here's my social security number, I have no fear giving it out. Yeah, somebody took it and used it and cashed checks with it. It's just too easy. Just a couple of things. While there are good reasons for the government to have data on us and use it, occasionally they get out of control, like their falafel data mining program. I don't have time to tell you about this. Look it up. We are going to go right now into, ah, one last thing. <laughs> As most of you know, it's, it's, it's certainly not a secret, it was digged and slash dotted to death. Nanoseconds before I was supposed to come in here and give essentially this presentation two years ago, the FBI came into this building with a, a raid team in the jackets and the weapons and the whole thing and took me off to jail for the weekend. Monday morning, I, I had a wonderful sleep for the weekend. Monday morning they let me out. Prosecutor got in big trouble. Here's why. This is a guy by the name of Joseph Myers. Joseph Myers was a convicted, locked up mental patient in Detroit. He was a felon. He was a fraudster. He was a bad man. I wouldn't say that on video and in front of all kinds of press if that wasn't true. Joseph Myers is also an FBI informant who changed his name to Joseph Franz von Habsburg Lothringen legally and tells all of his targets he is the crown prince of Austria. In fact, let me repeat this, he is a convicted felon, incarcerated mental patient named Joseph Myers. Why do I care about this guy? And by the way, I can put up this photo because it's part of court documents. This is, all of this is public record. Um, Anybody thinking of suing me, it's in USA versus Santoro. I'm quoting a public record. 
What was my interest in this? A law firm came to me and said, we have a client by the name of Albert Santoro. Albert Santoro is an assistant district attorney, good guy. Goes to clubs, meets a guy at a club, guy at the club says, my name is von Habsburg Lothringen, I'm the crown prince of Austria, introduces him to somebody who wants him to manage money. Before long, Santoro was arrested for money laundering. He never took any money, he never laundered any money. He's charged for the intent. But we don't know who the heck this guy is. I got hired, my specialty is missing persons and tracking people down. I got hired to find out who in the world this, this prince is. And I find out that he's the former Joseph Myers from Detroit. I find out he's got a long history of frauds and drug crimes and violent stuff. I find out that he's living in New York, in Soho, with a woman and two kids without having divorced his wife and three kids in Detroit who he abandoned. I find out all sorts of bad things about him. And I start going around interviewing all the potential witnesses I identify. And everybody talks to me. And everybody gives me more information and more information and more information. His father gives me information. His brother gives me information. His mother gives me information. Eventually, I go and I interview his in-laws. And his in-laws freak out. And his in-laws say, you know, we have to do something about this. You've told us that he's got another wife. We thought our daughter was his wife. You've told us he's a convicted felon. We thought he was the crown prince of Austria. And by the way, that was the, that's not a joke. His own ex-wife, his own current wife, his in-laws, all thought he was really this Austrian member of royalty. It's amazing. The family complains to the daughter, the daughter complains to the prince, the prince complains to the FBI, the FBI comes and picks me up. Not very nice. I did my job, I did it within the law. Ultimately, as you all know, I was released pretty quickly. In fact, I was about to go to China on a job and the judge said, give him back his passport. He's not going to be a fugitive in China, is he? And the prosecutor went, no, Your Honor, he won't be a future of a vagina. <laughs> That's what happened. Why do I put this up here? First of all, for informational purposes, if you all want to know why it took you two years to hear this talk, unless you're one of the, the lucky few that went to Stevens Institute. That's why. But that's not why I put this up. The main reason I put this up, guys, when I give this talk, I like to say, I'm not going to tell you what to think. I'm going to tell you what to think about. This is the exception. I'm going to tell you what to think. <laughs> There's a reason that in this country we have a right to bear arms. It's because 200 years ago, power came out of the barrel of a gun, to quote a guy I don't normally quote. And the government understood if we're going to be a free people, there has to be a counterbalance between the citizenry and the government. Guns are not that powerful anymore. Information is powerful. If I, as an investigator, didn't have access to the information which would have gotten me this guy's true identity and true information and helped me help Albert Santoro, Albert Santoro would have been railroaded. And let me tell you that, in fact, the government is trying to close down in ways you can't even conceive FOIA, access to information, access to private databases. It is a tidal wave of information being removed. I mean, some of it is really ridiculous. Richard Nixon in 1971 gave a speech, a public speech on television, talking about how many ICBMs Russia has. Four years ago, that information was reclassified. This is the honest to God truth. Why, how, I don't know, I don't get it. I, I am proud to say I don't understand how the government thinks. It's, it's a shame what happened with the FBI. I mean, these people were considered by me to be my colleagues before this happened. Not so much now. The one thing, the reason that I come back here for every convention, and the reason that I feel comfortable as an investigator speaking to you guys, 
not the sort of crowd that I would normally lecture to, is because you and I share a common interest in keeping information open, keeping information free, fighting government effects to close information. You know, this is the name of the game these, guys, these days. You've got to be alert. You've got to be vigilant. And you've got to look at what I've spoken about today and say, how does this affect me? What should we do? Now, I guarantee you that there is in this audience, this is not a spot the Fed contest, because I'm pretty sure I know who they are, and they're very, very close to the stage. <laughs> I guarantee you, and I'm not going to point them out, because they are my colleagues, even though they are terribly misguided colleagues. Um, there are federal law enforcement officers here today monitoring the speech who are going to report back and say, Steve Rombaum put this up there. In your memo, please remember to write, I only put up there what's in the open public court file. Gentlemen. Uh, I will also tell you that the FBI made a complaint about me to the New York State Licensing Authorities Friday morning, I assume, to try to prevent me from giving this speech. Uh, you know what? I don't tap dance in a minefield. I stay within the law. I do what I'm allowed to do. 99.999% uh, of the time, I think I make the world a better place. So tough. Um, <laughs> one last thing. One, one, one very last thing. And this is from the payback as a bitch department. <laughs> Remember that wife that I told you about that he abandoned 13 years ago? No child support. Wife didn't know where to find him, to sue him, none of that. I'm a public spirited guy. I turned that information over to the Oakland County Prosecutor's Office in Michigan. There's now a bench warrant out for him. Um, sometime next week, I will be going, unless I'm locked up as I leave here. <laughs> I will be going, I hope, with the New York uh, NYPD warrant squad. We're waiting for this to be put into NCIC so anybody can act on it. And this guy in his Soho apartment will be pulled out by his hair. Uh, so there's a warrant out on him. He's a bad man. You'll notice there's no warrant out on me. So presumably, either I'm not a bad man or they haven't figured it out yet. Um, we are now going to have, <laughs> yeah, that's one of my favorite quotes. I'm sorry I zipped past that. Uh, is there a Reggie Montgomery in the house? We're way over time? Can we take five minutes, ten minutes for Q&A? Yeah? No? Okay. Okay, guys, guys, no monkey business. We're way over time. Q&A? <laughs> Rick, you, me, and Reggie. Okay, now let me tell you, I have these little false credentials. Everyone gets one who asks a question. Rick is giving out copies of Geek Mafia. And the best question, the best question, gets an Investigate Naked t-shirt. So, so please, don't waste time. Ask a I'll, good question. I'll start. I'll start with a quick question. You were talking about Google, and the guy in Florida, he had searched the uh, bullet wound to the chest, the right side of his chest search. And the detective recovered that, you said from a cache. Did you mean, I just want to clarify, did you mean from a browser cache on the client side, on the, on the suspect's I don't computer, know. I don't know the, the answer. Server? It, I don't know the answer. I know it was recovered from his computer. Okay. His computer was seized, it was recovered. They did, I don't even know who I'm talking to. It's like the voice of God talking to me. Steve, but they, they, they Steve, this is God. No, thanks. Um, I know it was recovered. The guy's name is Justin Barber, so I'm sure with a minimal amount of investigation, you can, you can find it out. If I knew who you were, I'd give you a little, little private detective badge. Here you go. Yeah, me too. Um, next question. Catch. Oh, well. Boy, that was a girly throw. 
Um, I work at, for a school district in Kansas, and um, I'm just actually transferring school districts. I was looking at the website, and they are, I guess you could say, pimping out this, I guess it's like an Amber Alert flash drive that they can give the parents to put all their child's information on that's needed for the Amber Alert. That's an awesome idea. Um, I was, I, and I think it's good too, but how, I mean, if you lose that. You mean like the photo and the date of birth and it's, stuff it's like everything that? That's it's a great needed. idea. And then they're also in Kansas City doing a, like a tracking bracelet, like the, the orange ones they do, but they're like little white ones for um, Come on, Alzheimer's guys, jump patients. Come on, guys, Oh, by the way, this is this is this is this is illegal. You can't have a badge that says you're a private investigator in New Jersey. You can if it's a novelty. Playing the way of this? Sure, this one. This, by the way, is Reggie Montgomery. He's a licensed private investigator, very close colleague of mine, one of the best polygraph guys in the country. Uh, I like to say he's the second best investigator in the New York, New York City area. No, he's, he's a phenomenal investigator and anything, they're over there, anything, anything that, uh, anything that, uh, you know, I can't answer, Reggie and Rick can. And there, um, what do you think about doing it, that tracking for the um, Alzheimer's patients? I mean, they're, they... They have Alzheimer's, they're not going to know. <laughs> I know I'm it's really safety sorry. and all that, so I just... I'm really sorry for saying thought. that, and, and I do think it's a good idea. I mean, look, the, 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 the privacy rights that are appropriate for you and me, for, for, for in my case, a partially competent adult, um, you know, shouldn't apply to an Alzheimer's patient or a, or a kid. Um, what would you say is the importance of an online presence? Because originally I thought that it's really important to have some presence online so that somebody doesn't pretend that they're you. So, oh, uh, Rick, this is a question for you. Um, Hello? Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> I, guess I, um, I, I think just go with it. I think the point is just be aware of I think I, my takeaway from my experience and, and my takeaway from even the first time I saw Steve's talk is that I think it is important and useful in the example you cited is a good one to have an online presence just be smart about it be aware just go into it and this is how I live now every moment of my life I just assume that somebody's going to find out what I'm doing but say, how, how do you get off of particular lists and stuff like that that's I, already you, been tracked you, you don't you don't get off the list if he asks how do you get off the list I don't think you do get off the list you're on the you the, the data doesn't get erased you know and so you just kind of live with it. And that's kind of the crappy world we live in now, but that's my opinion. One of the things you, everybody should know is that anything you do, any kind of communication you have, whether it's on the net, on the phone, on a cell phone, or even, unless you're writing down a tablet and showing him, you have to assume that everybody in the world can find this out and know. But even if it's encrypted? Well. Then, who, then who's going to get it? Has it? To be, it has to be decrypted at some point for somebody to read it. That, very true. <laughs> so if you're sending encrypted files to yourself, you might be okay. All right. All right. You, have, you have your choice here of a badge or a book. You can have the badge and a book. Yeah. Really? The badge was 25 cents, Steve. Come on. Less. less. Sorry, 20 cents. Less. I got these on uh, eBay. Uh, I got a badge. Okay. <laughs> One question is... Um, Badges? More... Go ahead. More buildings these days are asking for your ID and they scan it and have all the information right there. So how do you, I guess, what's an alternative way to get in buildings without giving your driver's license and every, all the information? I think I have no idea what they're he asked no how, how ways to avoid having, you know, like a bar that makes you swipe your, your card. Is there any way to avoid that? Stop drinking. Stop drinking. <laughs> no, just normal buildings do that. Normal what? Office. Passport? That's a good one. No. No? They're going to start running them. I mean, it's a good one for the next six months or whatever. There's normal the office buildings that carry it's a, it's, a, it's a private place of business. If they say you have to hop five times on your left foot to get in, they can say that. Yeah, not real good. That's, that's a crime, though. 
Yeah, so quick Hello. Yeah, it is. Right, thanks. So a lot of scary stuff, great talk, I appreciate it. I've been thinking about this for a bit and have really been thinking that it's the asymmetrical control of this data that matters most. So quick two-parter, how do you think these dynamics change if you start tracking all this information about yourself and become your own big brother? And second part, how do we get these tools into the hands of journalists, educators, and social scientists who really need to understand them now? Okay, what? I'm sure it was a good question, but it was just... That mic's a little hard for us. A little hard. Okay, yeah, you know, so one you know more what? time. And, it's, and, and guys, it's probably a bad idea for us to do this from, from two locations. Can, can one of you guys just like take control of the question? And, yeah, yeah. yeah. So just, just All right. All right, one more time in the back. Real quick, so how do, how do these dynamics change if you start keeping track of all of your own data yourself? and become your own big brother, and how do we get these kinds of tools into the hands of journalists, educators, and social scientists who could use them to do better than the government and corporations? Uh, the answer is, if you keep track of your own data, all it does is it lets you effectively know how screwed you are. Um, it, it, it does not remove that data from other people's access. I, I mean, if you start being proactive in the future, look, people ask you for your social security number, you give it to them blindly. They have no right to it. When I registered my phone in Texas, they asked me for my social security number. I refused. There's, there's a limited number of people, of, of types of entities, that have a right to ask for your social security number, for example. It's not a question of being aware of your information. It's restricting who gets it to the bare minimum. But I think, Steve, the, the second part of his question is actually something. I didn't hear it. Yeah, I know. That's why I'm bringing it up. Because this is right in line with what you're talking. He's talking about using the same sort of tools you would trace yourself and, and just keep making more people aware and especially journalists and people like that of the same sort of tools that are available that right. are being abused and this is exactly what you're in favor of you're in well, favor of the information is going you've, we've had this conversation many times the information absolutely. is out and i've got to tell you that's that's my that's my crusade to get this information out to everyone make people more aware keep the information free and journalists are the best at that number one get journalists to go to hope <laughs> <laughs> so they can so they can actually attend seminars on this. But there are, I mean, the, the Reporters Committee on Freedom and Privacy puts this information out, and, and there are workshops now. I mean, journalists are really starting to get it, I think. Yeah, and I think just from my experience uh, with doing the research for the book and everything, um, and I really am firmly convinced that there's no going backwards on it, and so I'm, I'm definitely in the camp of make everybody aware of how to get all of this and... and the, if, if all that information is going to be out there, then it shouldn't just be in the hands of a few. So. Information has been out there for years, and now they want to put it back in the bottle. Yeah. Privacy That's advocates right. want to now restrict the use of social security numbers. Well, guess what? If you have a, guy, a person's name and date of birth or phone number, you can get everything about them anyway. Correct. The only problem with restricting social security numbers, and it's going to be a problem when people have to do background investigations on a, on a new lover, a, uh, a, a new employee, potential employee, a new employee, or anybody for that matter, questions. your new coach for the kids, we have to have something that can identify the person <laughs> as... Okay, we got, you know, I'm, I'm getting, they're, they're getting a big hook ready <laughs> to pull us off the stage. So, so three more questions. <laughs> Because, because between the three of us, we weigh like, what, 800 pounds? <laughs> nobody's, nobody's hooking us off so easy. Okay, seriously, uh, three quick questions, and then I tell you what. I'll go outside the room. Anybody who wants to talk to me, I'll stay there for an hour, two we'll hours. Go to, we'll go down to the vendor's area. E even better. Yeah. You know what? Rick, go ahead. Rick, has a, Rick has a table. We'll go to the vendor's area. Anybody who wants to talk to us, we'll give you unlimited time. Go ahead, uh, three Steve. more questions here. Hey, Steve. Hey, man. How are you doing? I got an opinion question for you. Uh, I'm considering, especially since I've had unfortunate experience with past relationships, Mike, he wants to do a back down track on his next girlfriend. That's what you're saying, right? Okay. Steve, opinion? First, make sure she doesn't post to uh, don't date him, girl. <laughs> <laughs> um, look, the truth is, the amount of public information out there is extraordinary. For, for, for something like a potential date, 
you Frank, unfortunately, I'm sorry to say, you don't need a private investigator. Look at her MySpace pages, look at her LinkedIn, look at her, look at her blog activity, and you know what? See how far back it goes? Make sure she didn't create that identity a year ago. Just a little tip there. Next question. You're the, you're the yeah, next to last. Go. Here you go, man. I'll repeat it, but go quick. <laughs> uh, well, first off, two questions from uh, One question. One question. How do we protect ourselves from tracking with Google and other services? You, you don't, because Google not you only... You don't use them. Google not only amalgamates... You mean tracking by Google or tracking when you use Google? You don't, because not only is information that you've contributed, which I'm guessing is already endless and you can't put the genie back in the bottle, not only is that there, but everything that anybody else writes about you. I, I mean, hence the title of this talk, Privacy is Dead, Get Over It. It really is. You can't do it. You can't get the genie back in the bottle. Once information is posted, it is there forever. Okay, last question. Just one of the things that you keep harping on is sexual orientation. Harping? Yes, you keep repeating that that's something you can find out about a person. But it seems like in today's society, that sort of information about a person is much less damaging and so society has changed in a way that even finding out this information about a person is not as valuable or as damaging to that person as it used to be. Where do you live? New York. It's not damaging in New York. Talk to the, uh, to the nice educator from Kansas. Yeah. Ask, her, ask her what the prevalent attitude is in her community. Would it be better if society became a place where it was okay to know these things? Of course. But his, Haven't his you point, been listening to me for three times? His, his, and, and I've heard this talk now. Yeah, I've heard this talk several times. And his point he's trying to make, and I kind of had sort of the same reaction you did the first time I heard it. His point he's trying to make is that it's something that traditionally and still today most people want to keep private and are not aware how they're. So as an example, but it, it's one that gets politically charged, Look, especially for radical lefties like us. There's, but, discrimination, there's discrimination just on your data. Are you an African-American? Are you gay? Are you Jewish? Are you a left winger? Are you a right winger? If I look at your data, I will find something to dislike about you potentially. And what I'm saying is you need, maybe quickly, but what I'm saying is you need to be aware that that information is out there the same way just your name and address is out there. All right. I Thank you done. very much, folks. Thank you, guys. Oh, that's all.